Good morning. Amen. We're beginning today in another series of things. The key word is restored. Restored. And we're fo- our focus is on the book of Nehemiah as we consider the process of how God restores and what he does and what is our point, our point and being part of that process of restoration. From God's point of view, we are restored. We just got to catch up with him. <laughs> All right. So God sets up, and the word today that I want to lift up is a convergence. That is the coming together of two things. Israel had a problem, the, the, many problems, but they faced un, after gods, other gods. So much so that God says this to Ezekiel. I look for a man among them who would build up the walls and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land. So I would not have to destroy it, but I found none. So I will pour out my wrath on them and consume them with my fiery anger, bringing down on their own heads all that they have done, declares the sovereign Lord. I sought for a man to stand in a gap. And that's the call for each one of us. He seeks us to stand in the gap and intercede for other people, others. In this case, it was because all around what was happening to Israel was going after other gods, satisfying their own desires, the whole works, everything. But God said, I said that. I sought for a man or an individual, right? A man, individual, whatever, to stand in the gap. The sad point is is that he looked and didn't find anyone. So that call of convergence, that is that bringing together not just the promise or the, the promise or the prophetic or even praying, bringing that all together in what God is doing and what God wants to do. It's a convergence of what God does with both promise and the prophetic and prayer. God acts, God does, he does find someone to stand in the gap. So I'm going to go three three different places in the scripture and, and lay that out, those concepts. That is, that is the promise. That is the prophetic. The third area is, <clears throat> is prayer. That brings about the release from captivity and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. We'll start here, if you, if you if would join me in, in Jeremiah. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Getting all clogged up. The front, my, no, excuse me. My first point is, is in 2 Chronicles 7. Second Chronicles 7. And this is at the dedication of the temple. 
And what we've had, what we had was they were worshiping. They were dedicating the temple. They were worshiping. They were playing music. And all of a sudden, a cloud fills the temple and their worship stops. They can't even stand the glory of God in the temple. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we read these words after Solomon has prayed. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayers. I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. And when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among the people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears be attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. The promise and the dedication of the temple was this, is that no how, how far away they get. The promise is, is that if they would turn and seek his face, turn from where they're at, that there's a restoration. That's the promise. But that's not what they did. You realize that? What did they end up doing? They end up going after other gods. And so eventually Babylon comes and takes out Jerusalem. And so they enter into captivity, into captivity for 40 or for 70 years. For 70 years. And Jeremiah, if you turn there with me, chapter 29, or 25, sorry. Can't even read my own writing. 25. And the word of the Lord came uh, concerning all the people of Judah. In the 45th year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which is the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So Jeremiah, the prophet, said to all the peoples of Judah and to all those living in Jerusalem, for 23 years from the king of Judah until the very day the word of the Lord came to me and I and have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. Later on, chapter 29, he speaks of the exiles. And he speaks of a time in which they were spending in, in Exodus, in, in that captivity. 
It says for 70 years, 70 years, you'll be in captivity for 70 years because of what you have done. They were there because it's, it, and all they had to do is the promise, right? All they had to do is to turn. And yet 70 years they were in, in captivity. Now Daniel was taken to Babylon in, as a teenager. He was there for some time. And he's reading this prophecy of Jeremiah about the 70 years. Daniel chapter 9. And this is what I wanted to get to. In the first year of Darius, king of Xerxes, a Mede by descendant, who was made ruler over Babylon kingdom, in the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood the scripture according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet. The desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. And so I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O oh Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. We have sinned and have done wrong. We have been wicked and we've rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, and to all the peoples of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah and the people of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far. And all the countries where, where you scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. Oh Lord, we and our kings and princes, our fathers, are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept his laws. He gave us through his servants, the prophets, and all Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey. Therefore, the curse is sworn and judgment written and the law of Moses, a servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and our rulers by bringing us this great disaster under the whole heaven Nothing has been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought your favor, O Lord our God, by turning from our sins and forgiving, giving the attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does. Yet we have not obeyed him. 
Now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and who has made for yourselves a name that endures to this day. We have sinned, we have done wrong, O Lord, in keeping with your righteous acts. Turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and our iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petition of your servants. For your sake, O oh Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, O oh God, and hear and open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make request of you because... We are righteous, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, listen. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hear and act for your sake, O oh my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. Wow. Now, Daniel... Daniel wasn't in Jerusalem. He was in Babylon. He was taken captive himself. Did you notice as he's praying, he says, we have sinned? We have sinned. There's such a relationship before God. So he prays, confessing. And the reason he's praying is because he's reading from Jeremiah that 70 years are almost up. Lord, what are you going to do? Based upon this prophetic word of Jeremiah, based upon the promise given at the, at the dedication of the temple, when God speaks, if my people will call by my name, will humble themselves and pray. You see, God says he, he said to Ezekiel, I'm, so, I'm seeking a man to stand in the gap. A conversion begins because of these three items, the pr pr prayer, prophetic, the promise, becomes, comes together. And the time goes on. Daniel in this passage will continue to say, for 77s, a decree for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to be put to an end of sin, to atone for the wickedness, to bring an everlasting righteousness. To set, set up visions and, and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this from the ensuing of a decree to the restoring of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem until the anointed one comes. What sets in motion, according to Daniel, sets in motion for the appearance of the Holy One, the Anointed One, the Messiah, was the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. It sets it all in motion for the appearance of Messiah showing up on that day when Jesus enters Jerusalem. And present it to the nation. 
It comes from the edict by Cyrus, who was prophesied, his name was prophesied by Isaiah way before Cyrus was even born. It was, that edict was reinstituted by Darius, another king of Persia, to build the walls and to build the temple, to build Jerusalem. And Daniel says, starting with this edict of reestablishing Jerusalem again, time starts to march at that point towards the appearance of Messiah, that Jesus would come. We claim him as the anointed one of God who comes in the name of the Lord. Would we be like Daniel? Will we be listening in our day to the prophetic? about our time and the stuff that we've been going through? Are we praying and interceding for our nation? We have sinned just as anybody else. Are we interceding, confessing, repenting, and turning? Are we standing in the gap as individuals, interceding? Would we be the people that that God wants us to be in the midst of this time? So you see, a conversion happens and will be happening because Jesus, what? Jesus is going to show up beyond our time, maybe today. But how's our heart in this? In the 19th century, a young Christian heard a Bible teacher say, the world has not yet yet to see what God can do with a man who is totally surrendered to him. The young man, a a Christian, said, I want to be that man. Yet young man was Dwight L. Moody, who became one of the greatest evangelists of all time. Long before radio and television, when the searching eyes of the Lord found Moody, They found a man whose availability far surpassed his ability. But God can do a lot with a little (laughs) if he has all there is in it. Moody was born in 1837 in the little town of Northfield, Massachusetts. His father died at an early age of 41, leaving a widow in poverty and a large mortgage on the home. The creditors grabbed everything they could, including firewood. (laughs) Mrs. Moody tried to keep her family of nine children not only together, but together even to go to Sunday school. (laughs) But Dwight time Dwight was 17, he was a a successful salesman at the Holton Shoe Store. Moody accepted Christ in the back room of that store through the guidance of his teacher. Later, he became, became active and involved in Plymouth Congregational Church in Chicago. As a layman, he began renting a church 
church pews and filling them up with men and women who were invite, he invited to come. He went on to become a great evangelist, but he never got away from his simple commitment and the memories of his first time he stood and spoke as a young man. When one of his deacons assured him, in his opinion, he would serve God best if he kept still. Another critic praised Moody for, for his, his zeal, but pleaded with him saying, he should realize his limitations and not attend and speak in public. You make too many mistakes in grammar. <laughs> Moody patiently made a reply to the man concerned. I know I make mistakes and I lack many things, but I'm doing the best I can with what I've got. Amen. He then quickly looked looked at the man and searchingly inquired, look here, friend, you've got good grammar enough. What are you doing with what the master gave you? God is looking for people today who will decide to take what they have and totally commit it to be used for the master. God seeks a person to stand in a gap, to be the person we're called to be, and the way and the person that that he already sees us as. Think about it. And the thing that we have to come to is in cooperation with him that a conversions would happen. You see, we don't become better by ourselves, right? Tried? <laughs> Try to do that? Try to change? We can't do that. It has to do with the work in the heart. Work in us. Transformation. That has to occur in our heart. And it brings our abilities with his capabilities, no matter how limited our, our abilities are. It is in cooperation. And that's how the kingdom of God works. That's how the kingdom of God operates. The kingdom is his rule in our lives. God's rule in us. And through us. As we cooperate, and that's his grace in us. We cooperate, we're changed. We get, again... A conversions happen and God uses us. And the question is, am I committed to do that? <laughs> I know it's easy to say the words, right? It's easy. Yeah, I love Jesus. It's easy to say that. It's easy. To say that. But then when we examine our lives, are we choosing to live this step, this step, this step in relationship to that? Well, I know he loves me. Yeah, that's good to say, but what is it? How has that affected me? Or you. And our commitment and the things that we do and our behavior and our actions, our integrity, our reflection of him in our lives. And the one of the things 
One of the things that prevents us from doing that is that we don't take the time and apply those words of God to Solomon. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. And that's just not for us as Americans, but individually as well. And unless we do that, a heart issue, unless we do that, and, and we'll never really receive all the things that God has promised us when we were born again. Never. Jesus says you never would be able to Enter to the kingdom of God unless you were born from above. And that being born from above, entering the kingdom, recognizing the kingdom, will never happen unless we're born from above. Transformation of the heart. Change deep inside. change. And the promise of, of Jesus is that when that change comes, it comes and he compares it to the wind blowing. You can see the change that the wind brings but you don't know where it's coming from or how it's blowing because you can't see the wind, but you know it's there. He says, such as it is for everyone that's born from above, that a change and transformation of the heart in relationship to the kingdom, a convergence happens, a change happens, so that it be continues to happen inside of us so that the people would look at us and go, hey, you know, something different about you. Why is it that when things happen in your life that you're, you, you still stand in the middle of it? Still turning your heart toward God. How, how's that? That's the testimony. Clue with this thought. I saw, saw this recently, I think. That all the things, all the suffering that we go through, what it says was the suffering that we go through is a platform to display the glory of God. The things that we go through in life is an opportunity for God to get the glory. And it all begins in here. A convergence happens just as the edict came and started the time marching towards the appearance of Messiah. Can we pray together? In many ways, Lord, we have we're good at drifting, being distracted by our own desires, our own ways, what we want.
So often, Lord, when we see the things happening around us, we have, we have very little heart about the issues. We don't see what you see. We don't weep for those who weep. We don't rejoice with those who rejoice. And we really don't see what you see. And we don't grieve over sin. We just rename it, Lord, and we excuse it in our own lives. Excuse it. We rename it and we call it something else, but it, and we know, Lord, we, we should know, I know, that it is sin. And ultimately it's sin against you but also sin against our neighbor. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for the words that we use in anger. When we hold other people in contempt, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us when we, when there's things and people in our lives that we can actually bless and we withhold the blessing. Lord, forgive us when, when we complain when things aren't going the way we want them to and not just trust you. Forgive us, Lord. And teach us what it means to be cooperative, to cooperate with you. in the middle of everything. No matter what our health is or whatever we're, whatever our situation, our circumstance or finance, whatever, that we would grow in trust and know that you've got it. <laughs> 